Please welcome cinematographer Pedro Luque and writer, director, J.A. Bayona. Welcome back, J.A. Bayona. I'm so glad to have you here. Um, Thank you. I'm so happy to be back here, too. Yeah. Um, we were. I, I, I want to start with the, your entry into the film is that is seen through the eyes of Noma and the choice of that point of view, who, who as you all know, he dies. You know, um, and to, to, for us to see it through the eyes of the dead, um, you know, I, the, the, the film is based upon a book, uh, Society of the Snow, from Pablo Bierzi, who is a friend of a lot of people who was in that plane since he was a kid. Um, he knew them very well, and it was 35 years after the plane crash that it was the survivors who didn't recognize themselves in the tale. The tale was basically about heroes, about cannibalism, but what happened in the mountain was something much bigger than that. And then decided to write another book with Pablo. And then I was doing another film, The Impossible, and I really like to, to do extend research when I'm preparing a film. And at that moment, the Society of the Snow was published in Spain. Uh, out of curiosity, I, I, I read the story, I thought I knew the story because it's a very popular story in the Spanish-speaking world, and I was in shock because there is something that goes beyond the fact, and it touches something that is spiritual, almost philosophical, that made the story much bigger. Mm -hmm. And then the challenge was, how can I translate that into a film? Because every time we started to write a script, basically a script is about action and dialogue. So how can I catch that, uh, that, that sense of spirituality? And then I had this idea of telling the story through the eyes of Numa, who was one of the most beloved characters when you, when, when you talk to the survivors. One of us that is remembered that did the most to take them out, and he died 10 days before the rescue. Mm -hmm. and, bef and by doing so, by telling the story through the eyes of somebody who died, Sadly, I was touching that spiritual aspect, almost something metaphysical. And also, I was giving the chance, because the first time I sat down with the survivors, I, I did long interviews with the survivors, almost like We spent a, a week with 15 of them doing interviews. Uh, and all the time, they, they, they tell you about themselves. Actually, I got an email from one of them telling me, of course, I am the protagonist. You need to know. And, and then I realized these people had 50 years to talk about themselves. So the part that was missing was that part that no one explained because the ones that were able to explain it were not here anymore. So I had this idea, okay, the same way these people gave everything they had to them, I think, why don't we give the chance now the survivors to give their testimonies, to, to give them a voice, to give the dead a voice. Yeah. Suddenly, the same way the, the the dead gave, made possible their lives. Now the survivors were making possible to be to make them be alive again on the screen. And actually, I think I, that that's been almost also al almost like a healing thing for them when they see the film now, and they see that um, that now they are happy with the story. That the fact that they were able to return something back to these people, I think it's been something very healing for them. Um, I want to latch on to something you mentioned about, you know, a heroic film, tropes that were used to. And in your in this film, you dismantle the, the hero journey. Um, and also, I was fascinated by the fact that you explore a type of masculinity yes. in, in film that we're not used to, you know, that we're used to seeing males, 
you know, taking action and saving and stuff, but you find a different way to communicate masculinity without those heroic actions. Can you talk about that, please? Yeah, this is something we, we talk a lot uh, with Pedro. We used to do this joke, like like we talk about the, uh, the, the, the cuerpo como as a land, the body as a landscape. Body, the body as a landscape, which basically is true. We, we shot chronologically in order to allow the actors to lose weight. And, and to picture with the camera the transformation, you know? It's, and uh, I, 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 th I think about Numa, uh, and he needs, it's, it's a journey of self-discovery for him. He needs to understand who really is. He needs to accept his shadows and his real nature and be brave to be it. And, and, and by doing so, he's able to deliver himself to the rest of the group. Uh, actually, when, you, when, when we recreated the picture of the airport, there's not a single woman in the picture. So they took out the women from the picture. That tells you what was the, that kind of masculinity that you, find, you could find in Latin America in the 70s, you know? Uh, and they need to learn how to they need to learn to, uh, to, to relate to each other in a very different way. And that means also the way they, 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 they touch each other. They, sl they have to sleep like hugging each other. Uh, and they have to understand that sometimes the hero is not the guy who saves them, the other ones, but who makes possible the other ones to save them. You know, actually Numa is a guy who needs one to learn that. It's, a, it's, it's, it's somebody who needs to learn how to die, how to die peacefully. Is somebody who needs to learn uh, how to cry mm -hmm. because he's been raised in a way that m men don't cry. And there's a beautiful scene that his friend is telling me, if you want to cry, cry. You know, he, he cannot do it, you know? And that's what the mountain is forcing him to learn all the time, to, 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 to become another kind of hero because he was a hero. In the words of the survivors, they were the heroes, the, the ones who died giving everything they had, which was very little, their support and their bodies for the other ones to make it. Um, Pedro, I mentioned to you, I'm a big fan of your work and in particular what you've done with this film. I, I would love for you to tell us, you, you create this language between um, cinematographic, cinematographic and documentary style. Um, can you tell us about how did you arrive at that that blend? Yeah, well, that that was uh, <clears throat> I think it was it was our main objective, right? To find this type of language that was going to ride in between documentary uh, that, in a way, you know, to be to shoot how um, to shoot in a way that we um, that um, because the, the the weather, the complications, uh, the logistics of this shoot were, were so complicated that sometimes it would, there was just one way of doing it, right? The way that the mountain would allow us to do it, or the elements, or the space, and also for us the most important thing was um, to be in the service of of the emotion, to be in the service of the actors. Uh, we had a beautiful group of actors that were really well prepared by, by Juan Antonio and, and their, their coach, uh, their coaches, and, uh, and uh, the camera had to service that. So that created, in a way, that more documentary style, right? We had to be ready, we had to deal with the elements, we had to deal with the logistics of shooting in a mountain, which is in the snow, which is really complicated, and also doing it chronologically, we started to shoot and these people, you know, stopped eating, and uh, and we went through the story all together, like hand by hand. But at the same time, <clears throat> there's something that Bayona and me we love, which, which is like classic movies, classic cinema, and to tell the story with the camera in a way that's like cannot be cannot be told, you know, like with words or with actions only. It's a combination of everything. And that also seeped in into our language. And we, because we will like rehearse the scene and block it and suddenly find something and Jota will say like, what, what if the camera starts here and, um, and then moves creepings over these people and then finds this face. 
And that was, wasn't necessarily a documentary move, but what was happening was so real that the mixture of those two things ended up having that, that, that language, which was the principal idea when we started this journey. We were like, we need to be really realistic, but at the same time, we want to say something with it. The, the, actually, the movie starts in a classic style. Uh, we had that moment in the church that we reference the cinematography of Bill Sigmund. Exactly. In the Deer, Hun Deer Hunter, you know, like the use of the widescreen, like, like very classy movies from the 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the, it has a different tone. It's almost like a teenage movie where you can hear songs from, the, from that time. You can feel the energy of these guys. You can feel that these the guys are are like they yeah. feel, how uh, like no? Yeah, like po uh, so powerful or, yeah. or like overpowerful. Uh, yeah, and that changes. And 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 after the plane crash, we 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 change the way we approach the story because the things were really happening in front of yeah. the camera. We. We, w we prepared the actors for, for two months. We were doing rehearsals for seven weeks. We went through all the story. We and during that period, you also honed the screenplay. Yeah, yeah. Which, by we the way, this we is did it like the, I remember like reading about the way Ingmar Bergman used to work with the actors. So he basically will, will, will rehearse all the film. And while he's rehearsing, he will rewrite it. So he will adapt yeah. the story to, to the performances and the ideas you get on, during the rehearsals. So we did that. But after that, the actors uh, shot for 140 days chronologically in real locations very far away from home. So basically, they went through a street diet, um, feeling uh, the, the, the hunger uh, in real locations, feeling the cold. Very far away, out of their families, and they, that we were in Spain, and that was, and they were from Uruguay and Argentina, so the the families were from very far away. The girlfriends were all very far away, feeling that sen that sense of isolation. And what was more beautiful about it is that the friendship is real. Mm -hmm. These these guys, these twenty five guys, are going to be best friends forever after what they went through. And that's what I wanted to capture with the camera. Mm -hmm. When we shot the death of Numa. You can tell in the faces of the other actors the despair of knowing that Enzo is leaving the shoot because they had such a strong connection with him that that day it was super emotional for all of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think you, you touch on something I want to bring up is the fact that we're used to seeing you know, individuals in a film. Instead, you, you give us a group in the group dynamics and... Yeah, go ahead, Pedro. Yeah, you no, and, and that uh, it's, it's reflected in cinematography because a lot of the times we use deep focus just to have them, and from the beginning on, on, on the, 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 the choosing the aspect ratio we used, which is a little bit wider, it's 255 to 1, we wanted to have an, a horizontality to it, right? Not having you know, people that we play with the height on the, on the, and the composition sometimes, but usually it was this group is all together like this. They horizontal, right? They're all in focus. We see all the faces, and uh, and that's a, a a way of you know giving them the same import. It's not about them the the, the individualities. It's about the group. The close up was a group. Yeah. The, the close up in our film was the whole group. Uh, and actually, also the fact that and this, that that was the process of I remember telling the, the survivors, okay, you had 50 years trying to find the meaning of what happened, you haven't found it yet, and I have two years to find it. So give me some time. <laughs> and we did this kind of exploration during the story, trying to find what was the answer of of the question, what was what was the meaning of this, what what is the meaning of somebody who is remembered like a, a, an example of the excellence. Mm -hmm. One of, of the characters that is remembered to, to, to do, like, like to be a fighter, one that gave everything for the other ones, and he died 10 days before the rescue. What is the meaning of that, you know? And, and the answer is, there is no answer. Each of you is an answer, because it's about understanding how important is each, each character, each person. And understanding that was, um, at the end, what I, what I think was the essence that I was interested in the book is to understanding that you and the other one are the same thing. That you can live in the other ones by, by, 
by the actions that Numa was doing, he's living in the other ones. That's why they needed another film. And that's why they are so happy with the film, because they were, they were able to give something back to Numa yeah. by making this film. <coughs> and there is this moment when, when somebody approaches uh, Roberto Canessa, the, 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 the guy, like the kid, he's 18 years old, who's, who is an, in first year of medicine, and somebody, somebody says, you have the strongest legs. You have to work for us. That's the unconscious realization that you and I are the same thing. That if that if you Beautiful. if you survive, I survive, and I th we we got to this idea of why don't we do this with the audience? Why don't we give them the chance to die and leave in the other ones the rest of the film? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Pedro, you also balance the magnitude of the landscape and the humanity of of the characters. Can you tell us about? Ba you know, balancing that dynamic. Yeah, so uh, um, uh, for, for to understand this, this story, we needed to understand the place. And so <clears throat> well, the first thing we did is we flew to the actual place where the plane crashed and we camped for 20 days there. There was like... Uh, the same time of the year. Yeah, yeah, in October, it's exactly. But actually, there's a, there's a creepy story. I don't know if we have time. Go ahead, we we'll uh, love it, yeah. <coughs> actually, actually, it takes three days to get there, yeah. just to get used to the altitude. Yes, and, 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 and also it's like, if you get there in like in 40 minutes in a helicopter, but if you go by foot, it takes two days, right? Because you drive six hours up to a dry riverbed, and then you have to walk up, you know, like two days walking with donkeys, and uh, but, so it's like, but there was a, when we were, were there on um, 13, October 13, uh, 2021, I think it was. <clears throat> so it was 49 years after the, the plane crash. That's the same day, 13 October, at the same time the plane crashed. There was a big wind that came down the mountain, big storm. We were supposed to, to do an homage to them because yes. it was the anniversary. Yes. At that same time when the plane crashed. Yeah, and this big storm, like, uh, appeared and, and it destroyed the base camp. Uh, one of the, our domes, like a pretty big one, like a you know 25 foot um, diameter dome, flew away 800 meters. We had to rescue with a helicopter that thing, and we had to evacuate that camp. We left the cameras behind, all the carts, everything. The day of the anniversary, at the same time. Yeah, at the exactly 3:30. Right? And we look at each other and we say, wow, yeah. <laughs> what does it then, mean? Then, we, then we, we were able to go there and we asked for permission. We went like, oh, you know, this mystical thing only got, you, know, you can only fight mystical with mystical. <laughs> let's go there, let's say uh, thank you, you know, uh, please ask for uh, uh, permission to do this story properly and to be, you know, honor all these people that stayed we, here. We promise we will do our best. Yeah. We, we said, yeah, and we, we, and we, we worked hard. Uh, we, we did. <laughs> um, but um, so we went there, and uh, when we got there, it was like, wow, this is way bigger than what you can imagine. And it's really difficult to capture all that stuff on a 2D camera, right? Because cameras, yeah. you know, like yeah. you, you don't understand distance. A rock that maybe you think that it's like your fist, maybe it's the size of a car. It's like, there's no, it's super difficult. And. Uh, and imme immediately became clear that was part of the story. It's a big part of the story. It's the thing that doesn't allow you to escape. It gets you trapped. There's, it doesn't allow uh, for life. And uh, it became a character. So as, as much as we were like close to the, to the actors for the emotion, and as much as we, we were like uh, honoring this group, we had the mountains. And that joke that we were saying, oh, the, 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 the body as a landscape and the landscape as a body ended up being true. You know, we, we treated those mountains as, you know, as, as this big character that has a strap. And also our characters, how they become the mountain, how, be, how they become something bigger than life to having to survive. It's part of the spirituality of all this thing. Yeah. How you resignify all the things that you have in front. But also it came, Mostly from uh, pursuing the emotion. Yeah, and we, we grew up watching classic movies. Yeah. Like, like I, 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 I remember we talk a lot about David Lean, the way David Lean was all the time using the, the, the epic, but, uh, but at the same time a sense of intimacy. intimacy. Like how he uses the landscape uh, or, or, or the historical events to enhance 
the, the relations between the characters, you know? And we were doing the same. We had the perfect landscape. It's a, it's a story about characters who go to the mountains to discover the lack of meaning in life mm -hmm. and how you need to find by yourself that meaning. So to me, that image of this small figure in front of the whiteness of the mountain was the best perfect metaphor of that situation and how- They almost blend with the landscape yeah. after a while. Yeah. yeah. Um, Pedro, um, the the out, outdoors there's a metallic look to the snow, and yeah. then it is contrasted with the texture of the interiors of when they're yeah. huddled. You know, can you tell us about? Yeah, well, that, that was one of the beginning uh, conversations we had. We wanted to have this metallic feeling because of the lifeless uh, 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 quality of this place, right? And. Uh, I remember looking at the classics, you know, looking at Ansel Adams and saying, like, how do they, you know, get this texture to this this, this silver prints, right? The, how these photos look like me metal. And um, one of the things we did is we banned the color green from, from whatever was in the mountain, right? I'm so, looking so at your hat, and I was yeah. wondering, I never saw green in your yeah, film. Exactly, and we didn't want, and you know, like that kind of like green hue that's so fashionable, like in film right now, we didn't want that. It was had to be like, you know, real blue, white, you know, like that kind of, uh, even magenta, but not green. And uh, we didn't have any any element green. The only green thing was the logo of the Christian Brothers uniform, that, and that appears like twice, right, when they're in the mountain. Then, in contrast to the rest of life, life is super green, right, when they get down the, the mountain and suddenly they're in this beautiful green valley, you know, the river and everything, it's like, that's super green. Um, but it was, it was part of that uh, search, you know, try to search, try to find a, a, an image that was like, yeah, lifeless. The only thing that was like uh, coming out or like uh, that you could see was skin. Yeah. But when we shot the avalanche, uh, the actors, uh, I mean, I don't have enough words to thank what they did in this film. The way this actor put not only their souls, but their bodies in the performance, especially the guy playing Uma. Uh, uh, I mean, I don't have enough words to, to, to thank. He, it was his first film. So you can imagine, but in that scene, the avalanche, we were we were we were shooting that scene in a in a in a in a sh in a in a set that was seven meters long, and it was like probably like forty centimeters high, and it was nineteen actors, eight corpses, and, and a camera crew <laughs> in that space. Two camera crews. Two camera crews <laughs> yeah. in that space. So how? And I was I remember like I I try always to be very optimistic, and I was telling Pedro all the time, don't worry, you know, we will shoot it. We will shoot it as, as, as if we were there. How would you shoot it if you were there? Mm. So forget about removing walls, forget about all that. Yeah. You know, it's like, how would, you, how would you shoot it? Because then is when you give the impression that you are with them. It, it was all the time, I uh, it was like, the, my, my, my main direction to every head of the department was you need to work in favor of the actor. Because there's, we're gonna gonna be hand by hand going through the same situations, going through the same emotions they went through, and by doing so, we will understand what they went through, and by doing so, we will understand what they did. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. And and um, Jota, um, the 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 you you refer several times to the authenticity. Why did you have to go to the Valley of Tears and film there? And then you went to Granada in Spain. I, I, I never told the, the rest of the producers, but the truth is that I, first of all, I had to ask for permission, you know? Like, I'm, I'm gonna do this scene, I'm gonna do this film, and I really wanna do it right, so I wanted to be there. But also, I, I, it's impossible to tell the story if you don't know the context of the story, where they were, I mean, the the, the the, the first day I, I have arrived there, after three days, uh, I was so shocked, not only about the, 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 the look of the mountains, the, the scope, the size of those mountains, but the silence. The only thing that you can hear there is yourself. It's your breathing, because there's nothing alive in there. And I, I, I spent the first night, it, that I spent there was one of the worst nights that I, that I ever had in my life. I remember like looking at my watch, thinking that was already sunrise, and it only had happened one hour and a half. 
So that's the, that's the, the altitude sickness when they tell you about that. Yeah. I remember like waking up in the morning and my bottle of water was a, a piece of ice, totally frozen, you know, and I, and, and I was prepared. I, I had clothes prepared to spend the night. You imagine to, to be like that, not prepared for 72 days in that situation. So it was very important to be there, to understand what was that. And then we did an, an extraordinary job with all the visual effects department because we shot in a, in, a, in a pretty inaccessible area in a ski resort in the south of Spain. Yeah, Granada. In Granada. Um, that gave us like a very good environment, like a very similar shape, like a, an amphitheater of mountains with a valley, but it was 10 times smaller. Uh, and it had half of the snow that, that you have there. So basically all the visual effects department, they did like a thousand, a thousand shots where they replaced the backgrounds with real footage that we shot in the, in the, in the Andes. And it was uh, the best test was when we showed the movie to the survivors and they were so shocked because they, 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 they told us it, it, it really, we really got the impression that we were back there. We could recognize every single corner of the geography, every single rock, you know? They did such an extraordinary job in recreating the exact geography, using all, always real footage, because we were very concerned about using CGI, because sometimes CGI takes you out of, uh, of this sense of reality. So we, we, we spent 20 days shooting backgrounds. There was not much snow that year, so we no. had to go back one year. We went three later, times to the Valley of Tears, yeah. And, and, sh and, and shot again the backgrounds, uh, and then they did an extraordinary job, very ungrateful, because you don't realize uh, the work they did. The, 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 the shots are so well done that you don't realize that they are full of visual effects, but that's the, uh, that's the nature of their job. And Pedro, tell us about incorporate. I mean, you shot in Valley of Tears, then you shoot in Granada, in uh, uh, Sierra Nevada, and then you also shot in Chile and, Ur and Uruguay. Can you tell us about uh, incorporating those those three different stages? Yeah, well, take, in that sense, it was complicated because also we, we had a set that was in the top of the mountain in Sierra Nevada. It was really difficult to access to. We had to take, you know, these tractors that took like 45 minutes to get there, plus, you know, gondola before. And um, and that place was in the, you know, in the elements. And uh, sometimes you will get there, and, you know, had to dig out, you know, the pieces of crane we left the day before. Or, and then we, then we had, we had a backlot that we built that was mainly used for second unit. There was like a 300 by 300 feet reproduction of the mountain where we would bring, you know, like track loads of snow when we were doing like close-ups. And then we had a stage that was an interior stage. We, uh, we hired this company from Germany that they build stages, whatever you want them, and they built it at like close to the top of the mountain because we needed real snow, we needed real cold. <coughs> and, um, and there were like three units working all the time. So it was like a it was a, a logistical nightmare, but also, you know, everything needed to match. It needed to be part of the same movie. But, uh, but I think, again, you know, like the, the, the thing that, first of all, choosing the people, the right people to help us, right? But um, I think the, the, the thing that guided us was the, the, the emotion and just the, that language that we discovered by doing it, by following the actors closely. Um, follow up. You do shoot scenes with where it's actually snowing, yeah, and we feel the texture of the yeah. snow. You yeah. know, can you tell us about well, that approach? Yeah, but for example, we had you know what, like we had a um, an LED volume, right? This this is this this type of uh, filmmaking that's like an, an LED screen, and you just can play whatever you want there, and it kind of looks real, but it's not as real. And, uh, and we had planned this scene where they are like freezing to death on the top of the mountain. And we were like, yeah, we can shoot it here. You know, it doesn't look so proper. And, and Jota says like, it's snowing outside. And we are like, all right, uh, do we have a piece of a rock? Yeah, we do. And he asked the actors, do you want to do it outside? It's for real. And they go like, yeah. And we moved the whole thing outside, and it was snowing for real, and they were freezing for real. And they said, you know, it was, suddenly it wasn't like this big movie. It was just, you know, four guys around the, and the girls. Parking, in the parking in lot, the parking lot the you snow. know, with a fake rock. But, uh, 
it, you know, the emotion is so powerful that you see in the, in the faces of the actors that it's like, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. It's not about, you know, bringing your cranes and your stuff, it's just about capturing that, those faces. And, um, and then we had a, a, a mountain unit. It was like, the, the, when, the, when the weather was like crap, you know, like they would go there and face it and get those like super special shots while we were doing some other stuff, you know? Wow. Um, to me, it was all about capturing reality. I remember when I shot The Impossible when, with uh, Naomi Watts and Tom Holland. Um, there Ewan McGregor. And Ewan McGregor, yes, that the most rewarding moments to me as a director were these moments where I didn't know that what was happening in front of the camera was a performance or, or was real, that level of uh, truth. And this whole film was planned like 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 a performance to get there. You know, I remember like one of the it, it's it's a it's a very silly detail, but very meaningful to me. I knew that this story was already told. There were two movies, and I was not that worried about the fact. I knew the fact. I wanted to get the small details, the gestures that will tell me the story from a different perspective in a much more meaningful way. And I remember that I knew what was the ending of the film. I knew that I wanted the, 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 the actors all together in the same shot because what, this is what they did after s spending 72 days in the snow and created this, this strong group. The first thing c civilization did when they got to the hospital was to separate them and put them each of them in a, in a, in a different room. And at night, they had to gather together again. Um, and I, I, I thought it was the perfect metaphor that they will be forever in that plane. You know, they had to recreate that plane at the, in the last shot. But I, but I didn't know how to get there. So I asked the survivors, uh, why, don't you, why don't you ask me, each of you, an email telling me what, 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 what did you do? What, ex what, what are your memories from the moment you, you were taken to the hospital? And I remember one of those emails, one from Roy Harley telling me, well, my father was all the time with me, all the time. I remember that uh, I was so weak that I was taking a shower, two nurses were helping me, and my father was there waiting with the towel because he couldn't separate from me at any, at any moment, you know? He was, and I thought, that's a beautiful image, you know? I, I want to shoot that. But instead of only shooting that, we, yeah. we had this, this idea all the time to do like very long takes. Uh, to, not to lose the energy and to allow, to allow the actors to really get to, to where we were looking for. Mm -hmm. So they, they did the whole thing. They, 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 the actor took the whole shower, the father was waiting there with a the towel, and then the, the, uh, the, the father embraces the kid with a towel, and then he starts to, I remember that he cuts his uh, nail to, uh, in, uh, nail tooth, nails, two, yeah, two, yeah. two nails, yeah. because the actor spent four months without cutting them. Yeah. Wow. And I said, and I said, okay, we need to do that shot. Yeah. Let's do that it's shot. Now. Okay. Mm. <laughs> so, and and he, he did that, and then it was a very long take, like almost twenty-five minutes, yeah. non, without cutting, you know. And there is this moment when the, finally you see the kid with the father, and and the father is dressing up his hair, and it looks like he's finally calmed down. And then I look at his hand, and his hand is shaking. And I ask the cameraman go very slowly, very slowly, and end up in the hand. That hand shaking is telling me that this kid is still in the mountain. Mm -hmm. And that happened for real. And to get there, it's, it's not something that you can write in a script and, and force it in the, in the shoot. It's because the actor spent 140 days shooting. He, he had a very strong uh, connection with the real survivor. He, yeah. was, he really was possessed. By, by, by the character. He really cared about the story and about the way we, we are telling the story. And he was still there. And, and that's, that's the image I was looking for. I didn't know that I was looking for that image, but I was looking for it. And when I found that, I said, well, this is it. This is the image that is telling me the story. That's great. Yeah. I literally go, go on talking with you guys for the whole afternoon. One, <laughs> last, que one last question. Um, the score. I'm a huge fan of Michael Giacchino. What blew me away about what you guys came up with together is that your film tracks the progression of the individual to this group 
dynamic. And the score tracks, it mirrors that dynamic of, of the progression of the group. You know, can you tell us about working with Michael Giacchino? Yeah, he's, he's, a, he's a very good friend of mine. We met 13 years ago in Spain in a film music festival. I, uh, I've always been a huge fan of film soundtracks. So I remember I went to that festival and I met him. For, we, we, we became friends immediately. Uh, and, and he's not only a great musician, he's a great storyteller. So every time I, I, I did a film, I came to LA and I show him the cut and he will give me ideas. And, and suddenly I, 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 I did Jurassic World 2 and he was the composer of the first one. So it was funny. It was okay, Michael, I guess I'm, we're going to work together. You know, but that was no plan. Uh, and then I show him the, um, the, the cat from Society of the Snow, and he immediately wanted to, to be part of it. He was very, very moved by the story. And I think he, f he, he was able to, to see the film from like the whole picture, to understand that it was a very emotional film. And we had to measure the emotion in a way that it, it worked because it was so emotional that you could get, a, get exhausted when you are one hour into it. And he measured the emotion in a way that, that it works at the end, like you're really with them when the rescue finally arrives. And one thing that, because you cannot separate the score from the sound design. They, they, I put them in to work together he in contact. It has wind as well, right? Yeah, yeah, and these kind of icy sounds. Uh, he, he used candombe, who is a Uruguayan rhythm that comes from the, from the uh, African immigrants. Yeah, yeah, yeah from the, uh, from the it's, it's the story of Uruguay similar to the US. Uh, I think we abolished uh, slavery a little bit earlier though, but, but, uh, but uh, yeah, the, the, the African, Amer the African um, slaves brought this music to Uruguay and uh, when we were researching, I remember like, this needs to be there, you know, it's part of the, the DNA of our, of our people. So oh, I sent uh, Bayona the, some, some of these more like experimental candombe stuff, and it, it but worked. But, but, but Michael came with the, the idea at the, fir at the same time. And he said, these guys, when they go to an expedition, we really need to, need to feel the same energy. They, yeah. they need to face what they're going to do with the energy. Of 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 of, the, of this music, and then he showed me this candombe that I, I sent to him, and he said, "Yeah, that's candombe." Yeah, that's exactly that's yeah. exactly what I was thinking about. Um, uh, and and one of the things that I really appreciate, uh, apart from this kind of like constraint that he did so so well, is the use of silence. Is to be so humble, not to play music in in moments that other composers will fill with music, and that's something that. Um, we discuss a lot with also the sound department because it's, silence is very interesting because it's like those painters that start working from the dark instead of using color or, 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 or light. Uh, from the moment you, in the silence, from the moment you, you play something, it's very meaningful. And also silence doesn't allow the audience to know what to feel. So it's the audience who decides what to feel about each moment and makes them to participate in the film. And I thought that was a lot more interesting than telling the audience all the time what, what, what to feel about the sequences. Well, uh, Pedro, great honor, big fan. Thank you. So glad you're here. Bayona, you need to come back year after Any, year. Anytime you I want, I I'd love to be here. I adore you having guys. you here, yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>